Good morning. Remember, one of my business classes in my undergraduate work, we were going through um, a, a part of a phase in the course work where we were talking about how to evaluate a business, how to assess a business to see if, if the business is healthy, if it's, if it's strong. And um, the first part of that, one of, the first part of one of the methods began by asking two basic questions. Number one, what business are you in? And number two, how's business? And it, it stuck with me, number one, because of the simplicity, because, you know, hey, <laughs> I don't have a lot to work with up here. Um, and then two, the fact that it gets to the main point pretty quick. Because when you're asking the question, what business are you in, it, it's a question of purpose. It's a question of, can you hit the bullseye? It's not good enough just to be on the target. You're wanting the bullseye. And then, how's business? Are you about what that, that purpose is? So when we think about the church and we ask the question, what business are we in? Church, what business are we in? We're in the disciple-making business, all right? So that's our bullseye. That's how we evaluate everything that we do. That's how we assess if we're winning, if, if we're doing well, if we're seeing success. So when we ask the question, how's business? What are, we, what are we churning out as a church? Are we making disciples? See, disciples, that's the bullseye. Now, I'm not talking about busyness because you can be busy, a church can be busy, an individual can be busy and not be productive. Uh, we can be running around all over the place and not seeing people come to maturity in their walk with Jesus. We can have all kinds of events and programs and everything, but at the end of the day, we're not making disciples. I'm not talking about the size of membership or attendance. Um, you give me enough money and I can draw a big crowd. Uh, but we're not in the crowd drawing business. We're in the disciple making business. We're not about being the coolest church or, I, I, I did my homework on this one, KFC would be proud. It, it, we're, not to be, we're not trying to be the most lit, the most trendy, the most dope, the most fire, or to have people say, that church is cooking. All right. So, uh huh. Yeah. So I just, I, you know, I'm scoring some points down here with the, with the guys. So, um, but we're, those aren't the things, that's not our purpose. That's not our, our bullseye. What we want to see are people making professions of faith that lead people to intentionally follow Christ and eventually, grow in, as they grow in spiritual maturity, become disciple makers themselves. We, we want people going from becoming a disciple to becoming a disciple maker. See, that's the business that we're in. That's who we're supposed to be as a church. So how do we know if we're being successful or if, as a lot of people like to say, how do we know if we're winning? How do we know as a church if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing instead of just going through the motions? Are we hitting the bullseye? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, I'm going to walk you through that because Paul, I think, gives us three things here um, that will help us not only evaluate where we are as a church, but also evaluate where we are individually because the church is not a building. In fact, as Dana was talking, buildings are simply tools to help us do the job. To buildings are simply tools to help us make disciples. Every building that we will have here will be a multi-purpose building that at the end of the day, does it help us to make disciples? We evaluate every building that we have, every program that we have, everything that we do. The bottom line is, does it help us to make disciples? So Paul, as he's talking, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 22, Paul says, to the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Paul is emphasizing his, his willingness to adapt to different people in different situations in different contexts so that he can relate to them, so that he can build relational bridges to them. He's not saying, uh, well, y'all come to me. No, Paul's going to them. He's trying to build those relationships 
and, and find points of commonality with them so that he can understand their context so he can better impact them for the gospel of Jesus. He goes on so, and says, why do I do this? Why, why do I become all things to all people so that I might save some? He says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Everything Paul does, he's, he's saying, I'm doing this for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel of Jesus Christ is what has changed my life. It is what has changed me and given me purpose and blessing. I want to share that with other people. So this is the thing that drives Paul. It, 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 his selflessness, it serves as a model for us as we prioritize our walk with the Lord and sharing the gospel with others over personal preference. And that, that's what Paul's getting at. I become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some and I do it for the sake of the gospel. Why? Because I want to see them, their lives impacted by Christ. And when, you're, when you live a life like that, it means your personal preferences go down the priority list. The gospel is what is important. He goes on, verse 24. He says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Now, the walking with the Lord is something that has to be purposeful. Our, our church has to be purposeful in what we do. We just don't kind of say, get, come in every week and say, I wonder what will happen this week. We have to be motivated, dedicated about getting in there, applying our purpose to the context in which we are so that we can see lives impacted for Jesus Christ. And he, he uses a, the metaphor of a race because you know, we got a lot of runners in here, right? You, you don't just kind of show up to a race and hope you do well, right? What, what precedes coming to, going to a race? A lot of hard work, right? I mean, I see you guys running up and down the road past my house and, and everything. I know how hard you work. I know how far you run. You don't just show up and hope it happens. Uh, it doesn't work in sports, and it doesn't work in life, and it doesn't work in the church. We don't just show up and kind of hope it's going to happen. I wonder who's going to show up today. No, it, we are supposed to go get people. We are supposed to go into the communities, our mission field that God has placed us in, have to be focused and intentional so that we can have the gospel out impacting lives. Verse 25, he says, For every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. He's talking about these spiritual disciplines that we incorporate in our lives. You know, all have heard me use the illustration of the U-turn before, where prior to coming to Christ, we, we, the only thing that we're living for is what makes me happy. So I evaluate every decision on what will make me personally happy. Well, when I, hear, when I understand the gospel and this self-centeredness, this selfishness is anti antithetical to the gospel message, and I find out that Jesus Christ died on a cross to save me from my sin so that I could be reconciled with the Father, that I could have purpose and have a relationship with Him, the one that I was meant to have, the, the, the purpose for which I was created, I understand that this selfishness leads me down a dead-end road that ultimately does not lead to my happiness, but leads to disillusionment and brokenness. So the Bible says, repent and believe. So there came a day in my life where I repented. I did a U-turn in my life. I turned from the self-centeredness, from the selfishness, and turned to Jesus. Now, this is what the Bible refers to as salvation. It's an event. It's something when you come to know Jesus, when you repent of your sins and trust Jesus, the Bible tells us we're saved. But it's at that moment that I begin a journey in my life. The Bible refers to that journey as sanctification. This is where I begin becoming more like Jesus Christ each day. It means I, be, I start discarding the old habits, the old ways that I had in my life, the old ways of thinking, and I become like Jesus. So Paul here is saying that these, the self-control that he exhibits, those, self, those disciplines in our lives, we incorporate those things in our lives so we can become more like Jesus. We become more sanctified as we go. And he says, we, he says runners do it to get a perishable thing, a trophy. 
And I remember when I won trophies when I was in, in school, I, man, that was the greatest thing. The bigger the trophy, the better it made you feel, right? Most of those trophies got thrown away over the years, right? I, I don't, I'm not walking around with it today. <laughs> Look what I got in sixth grade. <laughs> no, you, the, nobody cares anymore. It really, it doesn't mean anything now. And that's kind of what Paul is saying here, as important as sports are, winning a national championship, winning a region, winning state, winning all this stuff. It's really important right now, but in the grand scheme of things, we're talking about eternity. What we do, the impact that we make in people's lives is about something that will be forever. It's not passing away. It's not going to get thrown away. When somebody comes to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that is an eternal impact. That's what we're about. So he goes on in verse 26. He says, so I do not run aimlessly. In other words, I don't just get up and wonder what's going to happen today. He said, no, I don't run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. In other words, he's gonna, he lives an intentional life, a goal-oriented life, having clear objectives in his life how he can grow to be like Jesus. Verse 27, he says, but I discipline my body. I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. You know, Christianity is not about just coming to church and sitting in a big room once a week. If this is all you do, you'll never grow in your walk with the Lord. And I think it's this that disillusions people when they come in. And say, well, I go to church all the time, and I, I, I ask God to bless my meals, and, and I, I, I read the Bible when I remember, and I pray when I remember, but I just don't feel like I'm growing. If we applied that same approach to every other area in life, we would be disillusioned in every other area of life as well, Right? So in our walk with the Lord, Paul says, I discipline my body. I keep it under control. In other words, he is focused. He is dialed in because he sees becoming like Jesus is the goal in his life now. It's what drives him. It's what motivates him. He's not complacent. Not complacent. And I think in the church today, there's so much complacency. It's just kind of, yeah, it's, we come to church with a yawn. We get in the middle of the service. We're looking to see if it's about over so we can go get lunch or go watch the ball game. And it's, we, we've gotten to the point to where church is just these, we're just kind of going through the motions. Paul says, no, oh, when you're in a race, you're, you're not thinking about going out to eat afterwards. When you're in the middle of a game, when you're competing, you're dialed in on what you're doing. You're focused on what you're doing. Paul uses that analogy. You can take that and he applies it to the Christian life. Are we as dialed in as we are on the football field in our faith? Are we as dialed in in our faith as we are when we're running? Are we as dialed in in our faith when we're at work? Paul says, I discipline my body. I keep it under control. Why? So I myself don't get disqualified. Now, Paul you know, God worked through Paul's life, and he wrote most of the New Testament. But Paul's saying, look, this doesn't just happen. you got to work at it. You have got to be intentional. So as we read this portion of Scripture from the Apostle Paul, there are three necessities for spiritual growth and fulfilling God's mission for our lives that I want us to look at. These three things are going to be in your bulletin. Number one, adaptability is necessary in reaching people for Christ. Paul said, I've become all things to all people. In other words, Paul is saying, God, where's my mission field? Who is in my mission field? What is necessary for me to reach them with the gospel? See, God has placed us here, right here, at the corner of Mount Vernon, and Highway 60, between two high schools right here, surrounded by people and more coming every day, whether we like the fact that more are coming, God's sending them. Amen? 
So as we look at that, see, churches that are making disciples, churches that are being productive in the kingdom are churches that are willing to do whatever it takes to reach people. They're not going to say, well, I'll go this far, but we, I'm going to draw a line right there. Right? We, you know, we'll do everything but that. You know, I, I think about relationships and going to people's houses, and especially with family. You always have different types of family members, all right? Sometimes you have family members that when you go to their house, it's like walking into a museum. If you have kids, you grab their hand and you say, for the love of God, please don't touch anything. Take your shoes off at the door, sit next to me, and don't move. Have y'all, did y'all know what I'm talking about? Ever been? Okay. All right. Kids are uptight. Y'all are being too loud. Be quiet. Don't play, don't play with that. Don't put that down. Look, pay attention. Look people in the eye. How enjoyable is that? It, you're uptight the whole time, and, and as a kid, you're just like, when can we leave? But then you get the family members that, man, when they know you're coming, they prepare the house for you. They got games set up outside. They fix something special for you. And you can't wait to go over there. Because you know when you go as a kid, you know that these people, they're wanting you to come. They're looking forward to you being there. Do y'all have memories of, of going to grandparents' houses or aunts and uncles? or cut with, And that's what their house was like. You couldn't wait to go over there and you never wanted to leave. The church is not a museum. There's too many times that we're reaching people that don't have Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Can I tell you something? If you don't have Jesus in your life, you're going to be living like you don't have Jesus in your life. Right? They don't, people with that, they don't look like church people. They don't talk like church people. And I'm going to say this, and I know I'm going to make somebody mad. But they haven't learned how to be fake like a lot of church people. It got quiet, Caleb. I, I mean, do, do y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, you walk into church, you know, you just had a glorious 15-minute argument coming down the road. And one of the pastors or the greeters there, you open the car. Hey, good morning, brother. How are you? <laughs> Fine. How are you? Blessed. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, kind of. listen, from 11 to 12 on Sunday morning can be one of the most fake hours of the week. Right? That's not what we're called to be. We're called to reach people and be real, be authentic, be transparent. Listen, the, one thing, I had a, a, a pastor tell me early on in ministry, you can't be friends with people in your church. You've got to be professional. I just told him, I said, well, if that's the case, I'll never make it. I'm going to be the same guy here that I am when I'm out in the lobby, that I am if you see me going out to eat, that I am if you come to the house. And our staff is like that. We're real. It's authentic. Being fake, was Jesus fake? No. Did he have friends with the people he ministered to? Yes. That's who we're supposed to be. There's not this group of professionals. We have to adapt and reach people and do whatever it takes. When we're reaching our 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 community, listen, students are, are, are the, the number one priority. Why do you say that, Chris? Listen, close to 80% of all Christians surrender to Jesus as Savior before the age of 18. Now, you can do look at any study you want. Reaching people when they are in the children's area or the student area, it's vitally important. In fact, student ministry and children's ministry... It isn't about entertainment as much as it is, or babysitting. It's about reaching the next generation with the gospel. Now, what's great about these students, I know some of y'all are on, some of them are gone on fall break today, but listen, you guys are not only have been impacted by the gospel, y'all are impacting other people with the gospel. 
You're not carrying it around and say, yeah, this is the gospel, I have it. You're out giving it away. You're out impacting other people with the gospel. And you see, that's what we're about. You're doing whatever it takes. I know sometimes it's uncomfortable when you're sharing the gospel with friends who aren't living lives like you're living. But you're doing it. And church, that's our model. We're not here to build a museum. We're not here to build a building. We're going, oh, look at the ornamental pews that are here. That's the... And, and if you think I'm joking, I, I, one of our churches, that when they built a building, they won awards for architectural design of churches. And you couldn't do anything in that room. And I thought, well, that's glorifying God. I, I, I have looked, and I don't know, maybe one of y'all have found it, I never have, of where God rewards a church for having architectural rewards. It's not there. This, this room right here is a multi-purpose room. This room will be turned over many times throughout the weeks, throughout the months, hosting banquets, uh, events, all kind, test, uh, testing for kids, all kinds of stuff. That's what it's supposed to be. I never want us, to, if we build a room that's only used once a week, shame on us. That should never happen. Tom Rayner wrote a book. Um, it's called Autopsy of a Dying Church. He lists 10 characteristics that often indicate a church is unhealthy. Number one, they have an inward focus. All they think about is, what are we going to do? How is this going to impact us? They just think about uh, having a good time with the people that are members, kind of develop a fort mentality. They have a preference-driven culture. In other words, when everybody votes on something, they're voting on what I like, not what it's going to take to reach the community that God has placed us in. In fact, one of the quotes in there, he says, you know that a church is dying when the preferences of the members become more important than the mission of the church. Another characteristic is a declining attendance. Because, look, if we're just going to be about sitting in here with a group that is so inwardly focused and not reaching anybody else, people are like, well, I can find a group more fun than that out here somewhere. Aging population, quit reaching students. You quit reaching young people. In fact, um, I'm not going to steal some thunder, but next week, we have somebody that's going to get baptized, and that was a prayer of their grandmother. Now, I want to tell you something. When I think about this, it gives me chills because I remember when the statement was made about, I'm tired of our church not being about the community. I'm tired of my kids and grandkids not wanting to come here. I remember when that statement was made. And I can only imagine what, what heaven's going to be like on that day when that reunion happens. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. Minimal evangelistic efforts. In other words, we're not about that churches that are dying aren't about sharing the gospel. They're resistant to change. They're about nostalgia. Oh, boy, when I was a kid, I got... I got baptized right here. I, I, I prayed to receive Christ on these steps. Surely we would never tear these steps out. Yeah, one day we may. I don't know. We don't put names on chairs to remember mommy and dad. We, it's not about us. Amen? See, when we begin to understand it's not about us, it changes our whole outlook on everything. It's about Jesus. Because chairs and windows and bookcases and podiums with people's names on it are going to disappear one day. They're passing, just like trophies. Failure to build community, having negative attitudes and financial struggles, those are all characteristics of churches that are dying. Paul says, I've become all things to all people. When you start doing that, when you become about the community, when you begin going out and seeing needs and meeting them in the name of Jesus, that is when, listen, you don't have to ask people, uh, plead with people to come. You start sharing the gospel and getting out there, they're coming. We're seeing lives changed all over the place, whether it, it, in, in everybody's mission field, whether it's at work, whether it's at it, it, different functions around the, the community. 
people are coming to Christ. This building that we build, part of it's going to be is going to be a multi-purpose building. Part of it will be a gym. Court space is at a premium here. Can I get an amen? <laughs> We're going to use that as a tool to reach people with Christ, for Christ. We're going to be partnering with the schools and the junior programs. To try. How can we be a blessing to the community? That's what we're going to do. It's a tool. Second thing, self-discipline is necessary for spiritual growth and effectiveness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pastor in Germany during World War II, he was killed by the Nazis because of his faith and his opposition to the Nazi regime. He made this statement. He said, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. You see, we, we like to be known, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm going to heaven. But then our lives reflect nothing about Jesus. And that's what he's saying. If you don't look like the Jesus you claim to follow, then you're not following anybody. Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. Jesus, when he talked about people recognizing believers, he said, you will know them by their, their fruit, how they live their lives. It should be evident. In fact, I saw a quote um, the other day, and I, I didn't write down who said it, but it said, if you're a Christian, the way you live your life should make every atheist question their disbelief. When we're talking about the self-discipline necessary for spiritual growth, we're talking about training, not just trying. There's a difference between training to do something and trying to do something. Life transformation is not a matter of trying harder, but training wisely. Um, a spiritual discipline is any activity that can enable me to live life as Jesus taught and modeled it. And, and I will ask you this morning, do you have a plan for spiritual growth in your life? Now, we have financial plans. We have education plans. We have exercise plans. We have all kinds of plans. But what I have found in church is many times people show up. They have no plan to grow spiritually. It's just kind of, well, let's see what happens tomorrow. We, there should be a plan in your life. If you don't have a plan... See, discipleship is being in, having an intentional plan for spiritual growth in your life. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you, write it down on your paper. You should be, do you have a spiritual growth plan for your life, yes or no? If the answer is yes, awesome. If you, the answer is no, I've got great news for you. We can have one for you today. Very simple. It's not complicated. It's a matter of making it a priority in your life. It's wanting to be like Jesus. Because the life of Jesus is simply a picture of what true spirituality looks like. In fact, when Jesus was a child in Luke 2.52, one of the things that was said about him was this. He, he, he was probably a middle school age, somewhere right around in there. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature with both God and man. His love for God was evident to everybody, and his love for others was evident to everybody. People saw that in his life, and I thought that was an interesting description, somebody describing a middle school age Jesus saying, he grew in wisdom and in stature with both God and man. Look, students, would that describe you in your life? Okay? Everybody, would it describe us? Do, are we growing in wisdom and in stature with God and with man? We've got to be serious, be intentional about having a spiritual growth plan in our lives. And then finally, the third thing. A follower of Christ's journey is a race towards an eternal reward. Guys, sometimes, unfortunately, we get too caught up with what's in front of us and we're living life too much for the now instead of the eternal. I mean, now, we talk about this kind of stuff 
all of our lives. We talk about it health-wise. You know, I, <laughs> that, I remember there was one of our senior adult guys one time, he, we were talking, and he said, yeah, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I'd have taken better care of myself. <laughs> well, isn't that true? Well, you hear people talking financially. Well, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have prepared differently back here. You don't want to wait until you're 63 to be start thinking about retirement. That's a decision you make in your 20s. You don't want to start thinking about eternity when you have a terminal illness. You don't want to start thinking about eternity when you're 65. God loves you. He has a plan for your life, and he wants you to enter into a relationship with him. It's about the eternal. There is an eternal reward. Everything else is passing away. All the stuff that we think is important, it's all passing away. Now, we get little glimpses of that in western North Carolina right now. Did priorities change over the past couple of weeks? They, they have. They have. There was a, a flood that came in, and all of a sudden, all this stuff that we thought was important, it, it's not important anymore. It narrows in really quick. I've done two funerals in, in, in the last week. N nobody asked to see their trophies they won when they were little. Nobody asked to see their car one more time. Nobody asked to see their checkbook. There's two things without fail, that everybody asks for. They want to know where they are with Jesus. And they want to see their family. They want to see those that they love. Without fail. Those two things. Every time. Most times? No, every time. Sometimes? No, every time. Where am I at with Jesus? Where's my family? Somebody asked me the other day when I was doing one of these funerals, I said, is it hard for you to do funerals? Um, not most of the time. I mean, you miss people because when they were active in your life, there's a void because they made such a big difference, right? So, But you also know where they are. This is not a goodbye at see you later. They're, they're in, in the presence of Jesus. So in that sense, it's not hard. What's hard is when you do a funeral and somebody has lived an incredibly self-centered life without Jesus and you get to the end of that and there's four people sitting there for the funeral. The worst one that I ever had to do was I did the funeral of a man and there were two people there, his brother and his brother's wife. And there was nothing to say. I asked the brother, can you tell me? No. Well, what was his, is there anything, stories I could tell about his life? Nope, he was very selfish and mean to everybody. That's hard. That's hard. See, because as a pastor, I don't preach funerals. You, we all preach our funeral every day. As a pastor, I'm summarizing what you've done. So when I go and I stand up here at a funeral, I don't, I'm not making this stuff up. You, you've given me the material. The question is, what material have you given? See, because all of us one day are going to die, and our family will be at our funeral. What is going to be going through their mind, and what is a pastor going to be saying? See, because we all preach our own funerals. And that's why, see, but then it's too late because when I'm, when I'm at that funeral, I'm not speaking to the person that has died. I'm speaking to those that are left. So my question for you is, are you living your life in light of eternity? Are you running the race of life with the eternal reward in mind and not the temporary stuff that's going to pass away. A flood can take your nice house out just like that. A flood can take away your car just like that. 
And all the money that you work to save, if you didn't have flood insurance, guess what you're going to be doing with it? You're going to be using all that money to live right now. Please do. I said, boy, he sure is on a negative kick today. Guys, that's life. It's life. And the question that we have to ask is, are we prepared for it? My, I, listen, I love to encourage, and I think anybody that knows me knows I'm an encourager. But you also have to be a realist. If I see you headed down a road where the bridge is out, should I say, I hope you have a nice trip. God bless you. Or should I try to stop you? If I love you, I'm going to try to stop you. That's my responsibility. Yes, to encourage, but also to plead with people. And that's why Paul said, I've become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some for the sake of the gospel. Because we're not talking about temporary stuff. We're talking about eternity. Eternity is at stake. And see... God has called every one of us to be disciples. So if you're a guest with us, you hear us talk about all the time, love God, love people, make disciples. It's not just a slogan. It's not something we ripped off from some other church. It's something that was birthed out of who we are. Love God, love people, make disciples. Every person in here, God has called to be a disciple maker. Everyone. There's no, nobody's excluded from that. Everyone, you have been called to make a difference in the lives of others. I, I heard a story, uh, or somebody shared this example years ago. I said, you know, when you take an apple, you cut an apple, you know, you can, you can count the seeds in an apple, right? We could cut this thing out, pull out every seed from this apple, and you could count every seed that's in here. But you know what you can't count? You can't count the number of apples that are in a seed. Because when these seeds are planted, a tree grows. When that tree grows, apples will be on that tree. It's one thing, when that seed is buried in the ground, it's going to produce life. And you see, the same thing is true for us. When we quit living life for ourselves and quit being inwardly focused and start being outwardly focused and we have our minds set, just like Paul, that I'm going to reach people, I'm going to be, be all things to all people so that by all means some might come to know Christ and I'm going to do it for the sake of the gospel. Jesus said this in John 12, 24, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for, keep it for eternal life. Now, a church, we can just count the apple seeds in here, and we can... Oh, we, we've got this many in attendance. We, we've got this many apple seeds. And if the apple seeds just stay right here, they never produce fruit. But it's once they go out and engage, then the fruit comes. You say, well, you know, Chris, I, there are other people to do it. I got, no, God's called you. There, there are other people, but God's called you too. And you see, one of the things, these two questions somebody asked, they said, if not now, when? And if not me, then who? There are all kinds of needs in this community. And too many times you have a small group of people that are overworked trying to do everything. And that's not what the kingdom is about. God's called the laborers into the harvest. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And sometimes we get so caught up in ourselves that our focus is this way instead of this way. Church, we've got to adapt to reach others. In fact, one of, one of the funerals that I was able to say this, I said, if I could describe this lady in one word, it would be others. Others. 
I thought, man, I, I, I hope one day somebody could say the same thing about me. So in our lives, what, when your family's standing there at that funeral, what, what do you want them to say with integrity? How do you want to be remembered? When you stand before Jesus, what are his words going to be? Because both of those things are going to happen to everybody in this room. That's reality. So we love God. We love people. We make disciples. We're about others. we got to get ourselves ready. We've got to grow in our walk with the Lord so that I can be useful in the kingdom. Students, y'all have done that when y'all were up here sharing your testimonies about how y'all are sharing your faith in Christ with everybody. You're, you're being useful in the kingdom of God. You're making a difference that lasts for eternity. And I'm so proud of you guys. It's awesome. In fact, this is the most effective youth group. I've been in youth ministry for a long time. All right, we're just going to say more than 10 years and leave it at that. All right. I am so impressed and proud of you guys in what you do. And I know we've just started scratching the surface. There's more to come. So this morning as we're praying, I want to ask you this question. Where are you in your walk with God? Have you come to the point in your life where you know for certain that you've given your life to Jesus. All right, that's one. Number two, if you would say, Chris, I have given my life to Christ, but I feel like I'm just kind of on a treadmill. I feel like I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. If that's you, you come this morning. But that doesn't need to keep happening. We can fix that. Number three, of you making yourself available to serve. Say, Chris, I don't know where I can make a difference, but if you'll point me in the right direction, I'll start today, tomorrow, whenever. But I don't want to be on the sidelines in the kingdom. I want to see God working in me and through me to make a difference. Pray with me this morning. Father God, I come to you this morning. Lord, we do thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you loved us, as your word tells us, for God so loved the world, for God so loved Chris, for God so loved everybody in this room, that he sent his son to die on a cross for us. God, the passion for us that led to such a sacrifice. Oh, Lord, I pray that we would have the same passion for Jesus. And, Lord, I pray this morning that if someone here does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be the day that they repent and believe. God, I pray that if there is someone here this morning that has come to know you, but they're floundering in, in, in their relationship with you and, and they want to grow but just don't know how, I pray that today would be the day that they begin growing. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here this morning that says, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm growing in my walk, but I'm not serving anywhere. I pray that today would be the day that says, you say that I want to get out in the mission field. I want to start running that race. I want to make a difference in eternity. Lord, your word tells us that when we delight ourselves in you, you give us the desires of our heart. And Lord, that's my prayer this morning for all of our folks. I pray your blessings on them now in Jesus' name. I want to ask you to stand. You come as the Lord plays it on your heart.